Welcome to uh, one of our fireside chats here. Uh, it's going to be me and uh, and the indomitable Phyllis Ransby. Um, I Tom Spiegel with the Spiegel Law Firm, uh, based here in Arlington, Virginia. And I'll let Phyllis do a better job in introducing herself. But Phyllis is a renowned employment law litigator, and she probably won't tell you, but I will, that she's on the board of the National Employment Lawyers Association, which is the premier plaintiff side uh, plaintiff's association in the nation. So, uh, so glad to have Phyllis here with us from, from, uh, from, from the, the sun. So Phyllis, I'll let you talk a little bit about yourself and your firm. Hi, I am Phyllis Ramsey of Ramsey Law, but I'm always of the Spiegel firm too. I'm still of counsel. They can never get rid of me at the Spiegel <laughs> firm. <laughs> never would we want to do that. <laughs> I'll always keep an email. I can always stay on instant messages. I always take some cases. Um, practice law in a lot of places because I was crazy and took the bar exam in a lot of places. <laughs> but we are based in Nashville, Tennessee, because Tennessee is the home of no income tax. So there you go. Tennessee practice all over coming to you today from sunny, sunny place that I won't give the location. <laughs> a non-disclosed location. Um, well, very good. Well, Phyllis and I today are going to talk about the uh, we're have probably three, we're going to have separate takes on this, which is fine. But um, the three things that we wish people knew before uh, when thinking about filing an employment law case. Uh, of our many years of seeing this, both the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, what we wish people, knew. a lot of people say to me, as I'm sure they say to you sometimes, Phyllis, you know, well, what would you tell a family member? If I were your sister, what would you tell me? So this is what we're telling you. If you are a family member or a sister or brother, this is what we tell you. So I'll let you start, Phyllis. What's your first one? What do you think, what do you wish people knew when they were thinking about going down this road? Wish the first thing that people knew, and this is probably two things, but I always merge them into one, is that first, bad things happen, even to good people. I think so many people come to us and say, but I didn't do anything wrong. But bad things happen all the time. We all know that now we're all in the midst of a pandemic. None of us caused this pandemic, but all of us are dealing with it. So I would always, I always tell clients, and I would tell a sister, a brother, a loved one, bad things happen. And the second part of that, is that sometimes nobody cares because I think a lot of times our clients think everybody will care about this. We can go to the media. Once you write a letter to our employer, everybody will get scared and care and bad things happen and sometimes nobody cares. It's unfortunate, but that's what I would start off with, not to be a pessimist, but to be a realist. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a great point. And to follow on with that, you know, sometimes the bad stuff that happens is not illegal. Mm -hmm. It's bad stuff, right? Like somebody's a, you know, a jerk, your boss is a, an, an a-hole, um, fires you for some unfair reason. You know, there's that big circle of bad stuff that happens at work and then a smaller circle of bad stuff that happens at work that is, that is, that, that is illegal or is actionable. So um, I think that's a great point. And, I, and to follow on with that, I think kind of dovetailing with it, I mean, the first thing I wish people knew is uh, go talk to a lawyer right? Go find somebody who does what you and I do. And that's the first piece probably is find somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, they're, um, you know, obviously a lot of lawyers out there, a lot of good lawyers. They're not, uh, not all good lawyers, no employment law. And right. sometimes people, you know, and they end up with somebody, you know, you know, and there's nothing wrong with personal injury. I mean, and there's some personal injury attorneys that do employment law, but just because you do personal injury, just because you do trial work doesn't mean, mean you know employment law. So find somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, you know, and kind of the test I would recommend a family member, you know, is, sorry, my dog in the background there. Um, <laughs> welcome, to the, welcome to the pandemic, right? <laughs> it's back there somewhere, uh, you know, is to, to find somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, and to, you know, great, some great resources are uh, the National Employment Lawyers Association, NILA.org has a good employment law lo lawyer locator. Um, you know, some other good ones, avo.com is a good one. And I would ask an attorney, you know, when's the last time you or your firm filed an, uh, an EEOC charge? That's the test I would use. And if they haven't, if they look at you with a blank stare or if they hadn't filed one in six months, uh, then they don't know that you, you need to go ask somebody else. And when you find that person who knows what they're doing, you know what, like, and I know people say, of course, you're a lawyer going to say this, but pay for some of their time, you know, and, and get a consultation. I think it's well worth it. And listen to what they say, because somebody who does this a lot, as we do, can really hone in pretty quickly. And 
you know, we can't say for certain how a case would turn out, but we can pretty quickly give you an idea of like, hey, this is, you got something here. This is probably worth, you know, pursuing or, you know what, you know, if this is how you want to spend your money, that's fine. But uh, this is, you've got a uphill, uphill battle and I don't see a lot of, you know, a lot of foothold that we can get. So I, I, that'd be my number one is find somebody who knows what they're doing and, and listen to them. And I think my second point would, would definitely be exactly that. I think so many people think of attorneys as one stop all, and we don't think of anything else in life like that. I right. really love my general practitioner, but my general practitioner is not the doctor that I go to necessarily to deal with my allergies and is not right. the doctor I go to for a GYN. But I think for attorneys, you know, even when people hear where we are attorneys, whether we're out somewhere, family members, they always ask us a question. When people come to me about tax questions, right. I typically say I am not a tax attorney. In fact, right. I'm usually in tax trouble. You know? <laughs> when people come to me about- All right, there we go. We had just a little technical difficulty there. Welcome to again to COVID times. Um, but uh, we will pick up again with where you were, what you're talking about, Phyllis, talking about how finding an attorney who specializes in this is worth it. Yeah, I mean, we don't do anything else in our lives. You know, we make sure that somebody is a specialist. We pick certain doctors if we have acne or we have asthma or if you need, if you have cancer, you wouldn't go to necessarily a podiatrist. And I think the practice of law is the same thing. So many people just hear, hey, you're an attorney and they think we can do everything. And there are some attorneys who can do many, many things. And then there are some attorneys that specialize in different areas. Employment law is such an esoteric area. I always ex describe it to people like that. There are certain deadlines that don't necessarily make sense. For instance, the EEOC deadline of 300 days. That's not like a year. Right. And I've been doing this for some years now, and I still have to look at the calendar to say yeah. right. 300 days is six, two months less than a year. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, or if you're representing a federal employee, they have 45 days to 45 initially days. make contact with the EEO office. And that is a month and 15 days. I mean, a month and 15 days. So I think you really have to get someone that specializes like you would in any other area of your life because it's an it's area, if you have an employment case, it's an area of your life that you have to make an investment in from the beginning, from picking the attorney. And I would say to add to that about picking an attorney, realize that your, your relationship with the attorney you choose, with the law firm you choose, is like any other important relationship in your life. The one with your spouse, your significant other, your mother, father, sister, brother, kid. You're going to probably be together a long time <laughs> because yeah. employment cases can last. So, you know, there are some probably great attorneys. We've had some great people come across both of our firms who may not be the right client for us. And I'm sure some people think we are great people, great law firms, but we may not be the firm for them. So in addition to picking the right attorney, I also think you need to look at the relationship with that particular attorney. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yeah, you know, talk to a couple of different attorneys, just like, you know, you could, you know, if you're going to have an important surgery, right? Like there are plenty of, you know, you might find a couple of really good doctors out there, but you want to talk to them, make sure that you're both on the same page. And because you're right, it's going to, it can be a long and sometimes difficult road. And, you know, you want to, you want to feel like you can, you can trust your attorney and you, you know, within reason enjoy spending time together. You know, I think to, to your point, you know, in finding that attorneys realizing like if you're in a, a rural area, there may not be anybody in your town that does this work. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't good attorneys in your town, but there just may not be somebody who does this. And it's okay to, you know, with the work we do, a lot of it's in federal court, you know, you don't necessarily need to even be in the same state as, you know, you and I both have represented people we've never met in person because it's all, been, it's all been over the phone. They've all they've been in a different state. So, you know, if you're in, you know, small town with uh, two traffic lights, you know, go, go look for somebody in the state capital or somebody, you know, in your state in a larger area where you're more likely to find attorneys who do this do this sort of work. Um, no, I think that's all good stuff. My, my number two is, and I know you're, you're, you, you uh, have seen this too, Phyllis, um, is just to your point, like that thinking that people care, don't think that the press is going to, the press is going to come, right? And I get it. You know, I, people think, you know, hey, I, I, you know, I've, this terrible thing happened to me. As soon as we file in court, you know, the press is going to show up and there are going to be cameras and the company's going to be embarrassed and, uh, and they're going to settle. And I got to tell you, and I know you've had the situation, Phyllis, they, nine times out of 10, they just don't care. Even if the press does show up, 
the defendant just doesn't care. I mean, um, because it's probably not going to get a lot of traction if it's a big company. They, the sad thing is it probably gets sued not infrequently. Um, they don't mind if they get a splash on the six o'clock news occasionally. I mean, I, I had a client one time where literally after we filed the complaint, the uh, press crews came and camped outside of the defendant's window in the company. They had the cameras like, look, like, look through the window. Didn't care. The company didn't care. I mean, we eventually settled the case, but it wasn't because of that. Right. Um, you know, there are some, uh, we did, we recently had one case where I do think the fact that we got some press, you know, uh, move the defendant to settle probably earlier than they would. But it's oftentimes either, either they don't care or, or it hurts, mm -hmm. right? Because the defendant is like, okay, well now this is out in public and now I've got to defend my name. My what company, do I have to lose? <laughs> what have I got to lose, right? right. Now I got, I got to, you know, I got to, you know, throw some dirty punches and, and try to drag you through the mud. So I, I, and I get it. I understand why people think this, but they're like, hey, you know, as soon as we file this, press is going to show up and they're going to want to settle. And I'm like, man, if I had a, if I had a dime for every time I heard that, I'd be retired. Well, another thing on, on the press, you know, as, as you said, it's not often going to the media that makes a company saw, settle, especially if you're suing a bigger company. They probably have a huge PR team. They have, they, they have things just for this. They haven't been sued for the first time. You are not the first person to sue. I mean, we can go on PACER or any online court system just today and look up what cases have been filed and hundreds yeah. in the midst of a pandemic still are filed. And actually it can backfire because if you go to the press, a company may be reluctant to settle because they are going to say, if we pay a large amount, it will look like we did something wrong. Right. Well, this is out in the news. If we pay now a million dollars, people will say we did something wrong. So it can backfire. The other thing, even if you have, let's say you have, we have a client who has a story of interest. We cannot control outside circumstances. Right. I had some very good cases that, that probably would have gotten press at the end of February. And two weeks later, <laughs> right. we entered unprecedented times. I mean, very unprecedented times. I mean, I literally had, I think I told you this time, I had a meeting set up with an opposing counsel for maybe that Wednesday before a lot of us, depending on where you were, but a lot of us shut down that Friday. Was it Friday the 13th even? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, wow. Right. But, yeah. I had a meeting scheduled for that Wednesday. We knew things were getting shaky that week and the opposing counsel is in an industry that's very hard hit by the pandemic and just said, hey, Phyllis, the case is still kind of important, but right now we're trying to stay afloat. Right now we're trying not to get sued for COVID related things. Right now I've had to lay off half my staff. I'll right. talk to you when this is over. At the time we were naive and thought this was over with me in two weeks. Uh, six months right. later, I still not talk to them. But we, we can't determine the circumstances. I, I've told so many clients in the last few weeks, there are really three main things that are big in the press right now. And if you don't really fall into one of those things, you probably won't get attention. One, of course, is the, the never ending and ever relent, never ending and relentless pandemic. No matter who you are, this pandemic is touching you. Number two is the racial unrest we're having in this country right now. And number three, of course, is the election. And so if your story doesn't kind of fit into some of that, you know, yeah, true. If the president fires somebody today and he's our client, that'll probably get a little attention. Right, right. So if, if some, maybe a few high level people at the CDC or something, that'll probably get in a little attention. You know, the police officers who may be fired or held to, to standards in this, in this racial unrest, that may get attention. But otherwise, we're overloaded right now. And again, that's not to say that your case is not important, but as I said before, trying to make somebody care about something that you care for is very hard. Trying to make somebody care about something that you care for in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of racial unrest, in the midst of an election is very, very hard. Yeah, well, and, and to your point, sometimes if, if your story falls within one of those categories, the fact that really, really bad stuff is happening, if yours isn't worse, Exactly. <laughs> I mean, like during Me Too, I'm sure you had this, like we had people call our office, you know, the, as a result of Me Too, that had some pretty bad stories. And uh, we had one that was, you know, could have been, you know, could have been somewhat high profile. Um, and we ended up kind of going around to some, some, you know, reporters and talking to them. And it wasn't that they didn't care, but they were like, man, if it's not Harvey Weinstein bad, we, it's just not gonna make the news. And so it was sort of weird. It was sort of like the opposite effect. It's like, hey, this is an example of what's going on. And they're like, yeah, but 
you know, it's got to be really bad now. It's got to be even worse it than it was. Than, than for us to, who, who is suffering the most? This is a competition. Right. Right. And you don't know offense, but if you've been laid off from your job or terminated for, from your job or run it, your, your boss was just bad boss. And they may have discriminated against you, but you know, it wasn't egregious, meaning there were no slurs used. You weren't abused on the job. Nobody hit you. It probably won't get much traction, especially now, because in some ways we're becoming desensitized to bad things happening. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're, we're all looking at TV every day and the worst of the worst is happening. Last year this time, I probably would have cried every day if I was watching the news that I'm watching this year. This year, I'm just like, oh, well, okay, one more thing. Yeah, you know. I know. And that's how much of our society is right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's your number three? Wow, I would say number three has to do with be reasonable. Know that your case is not like everybody else's case. And you may not have a multi-million dollar case. So be reasonable. Right. The great thing, you've heard me say this, and we've talked about this, the great thing about technology is that it has opened up an entire world for people who would have otherwise not had access to it. So we can sit at home and Google things. I've taught myself how to do some things over Google doing this. Right, during YouTube. This right, I always got to go to YouTube. How do <laughs> right. I do this? Right. So that's the great thing about technology. The bad thing is that it makes everybody think, everybody thinks they're an expert or knows more about a subject than they do. And even just the way algorithms and things work, it usually only pulls a certain kind of topic when you Google something. So back to the Me Too uh, movement, when the Me Too movement was very high at its, you know, at its height, we would get a lot of calls from people saying, I was sexually harassed at work. I saw Gretchen Carlson got this much. I want that much. Right. And I was like, yeah, she kind of made more money than God even before <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the situation <laughs> happened. And in employment law in particular, a lot of your damage are based, are anchored in what you made anyway. Yep. And that's put in aside that we don't have fair wages in many industries and many people are underpaid. The bottom line is your damages are based in what you made anyway. And so someone who is sexually harassed and makes $400,000 a year is probably going to have higher damages than somebody who's sexually harassed and ha makes 20,000 a year. Same with racial discrimination, any, any, any form of discrimination. And so I would just say, be reasonable. Realize that your case is different from other cases. It may just be one fact that's different, but it's different. Yeah. And so be reasonable, go into it with an open mind Again, I compare it to so many other industries. So it is like the medical field. Some people have cancer and live for years and are just fine for years. And then some people between diagnosis and death, it may be four months, five months, four years. So be reasonable. Know that your case is different from others and know that there are some multi-million dollar cases, believe me, but <laughs> many times there are not. <laughs> Right. There are, I think there are more cases that are not multi-million dollar cases than there are cases that are multi-million dollar cases. Absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, to kind of to dovetail on what you were saying, like be strategic, right? Like when you get to that settlement table, you and I both have seen people who like, get a good settlement offer and we tell them a good settlement offer and they're so emotionally, understandably attached to what happened and they're angry and man, they want, you know, they want to see that corporation bleed. And I get it. I'd, I'd be in the same, same boat, but I, you know, I love like, you know, a, a tactic that I stole from you, Phil. It's like, okay. Um, that you let this offers on the table. Let's pick a number out of the hat You know, $50,000 on the table. You're saying you want to turn it down before we do, do that, take out a piece of paper and write down all your bills, mm -hmm. all the bills that you could pay with $50,000 in your pocket. Right. And, th and then, you know, we, when you, when people do that and they start to really think about what that money would mean for them, all of a sudden they kind of come back to earth. And that's not to say you should sell yourself short. I mean, this is another point where listen to your attorney. If your attorney's saying, you know, Hey, we could push this to trial and you know, you might get 75 or a hundred and they're offering you 50 now because you could lose and get zero. You know, you might want to think about taking that, you know, be, you know, be strategic. Think about, think about what you count as a win. Because right. that can be a win. They just wrote you a check. They're talking about writing you a check for $50,000. Yeah. 
that could buy a lot of party supplies, that could, you know, buy food, that could pay off whatever, or whatever it is you wanted to do with it. And, um, you know, you could turn that, you could turn that down and get zero all because you want to fight for justice. And that's fine. You know, these our clients are big people and they can make that decision, but be very clear what you're doing when you're sitting at that settlement table. Yeah, be strategic, be reasonable, understand. One question I always ask clients is, what is a win to you? Is a win getting a huge amount of money? We had a case, Tom, through your firm where it was a great settlement monetary offer. I mean, it was it was really great, especially for the, what the case was. And the client said to me, in the settlement, I want to have a phone call with the CEO. I was like, whoa, I'd rather have the money. I don't care about the CEO. But okay. But for, for everybody, a win is something different. But you know, when you're being reasonable about it, again, that goes back to the points we said before. Pick a good attorney who's going to walk you through it, who understands your needs, who is going to listen to that. In this particular case, I was actually able to get it for the client. I couldn't even believe it. So I don't think it was yeah. any of my I think I got lucky. But you know, what, what is reasonable to you? What are reasonable under the circumstances? And when there is something on the table, think about the risk that you want to take. Oftentimes, the further we go in the case, we can get more, but we also spend more. Yeah. So it comes a point where it's the diminishing returns. If we are in a mediation and we have $50,000 on the table and a client says, okay, I don't want it. I want more. I want 75 or I want 100. We may go to trial and get 100, but by then we may have done more depo depositions we may have spent more money. And so when we have to deduct the cost out of that, you're still at 50 or probably less. And right. then I cannot repeat enough. This pandemic has taught us so much for all the death and destruction, for all the ways it's uprooted our lives, but we cannot control circumstances. And I did have mediations in the weeks leading up to the pandemic. I had scheduling orders where we were supposed to go to trial on a certain day and it hasn't happened. And I'm not saying we have to live our lives thinking when is the next pandemic coming? When is the next shutdown coming? But you do have to realize that there are some factors that we cannot control. And if there's something on the table or if, if your expectations are unreasonable, then you can never really be happy. And I, I think you have to take a long, hard time. I always tell clients, I always give them what I call our moment of truth. I always have a session that I call our moment of truth yeah, and say, right. what do you really want out of this? And oftentimes, believe it or not, money is not the first thing that yeah. people say. They'll say, I want justice. And Tom knows my joke. I always say, well, if there was justice, you would not have had to call us in the first place because right. we only exist because justice does not exist. Right. Right. I mean, we would have jobs just in a different area. But also, justice does not pay bills. And Tom has heard me say this. I'll come in the office and flick on the lights and the cash pay for those lights to come on. Yeah. Cash pay for these devices that we're talking on today. Cash pay for this internet service that keeps going out <laughs> today. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think you need to be reasonable about what you want. If, yeah. if your damages are $10,000 and you want a million, it's not going to happen. If you, I have a client now who is making a claim under the ADEA, age discrimination case, and she wants $50,000 in emotional distress. That's not only unreasonable, it's impossible because there are no emotional yeah. distress. Right. You get it. Right. And, and so, you know, definitely be reasonable um, and, and think about what reasonable is. Ask your attorney what reasonable is and realize that what's reasonable in your case. It was totally reasonable for Gretchen Carlson to get the amount she got because of the amount she made. That's not necessarily the same with our client who may work in another industry. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. Um, and, and my number three, you know, to, to kind of end on a positive note, and I think you'll join me in this is like, you know, because we, we talked about some cautionary tales, which are important for people to know. But but for those people, you should also know you can win. I mean, depending on what your definition of a win is, like, don't think, you know, well, I'm just a little person. You know, this wasn't bad enough. I don't have a smoking gun email. Like, you know, I've, you've, you've probably seen this, too, where we've had people who waited and waited to come to see us. And I'm like, man, I wish you would come earlier. I wish you had just come like right after this happened. I wish you had done it. You know, like I've even had people and you probably had this too, fellas come to me and they're like, I felt sort of guilty about, you know, yeah. I didn't want to put my job. I didn't want to hurt my, my company. And I'm like, I get that. That's a, that's a noble feeling, but man, they're, I just put you in a worse spot, you know? So know that, that victory happens, you know, you and I have people, you know, 
the, all these, a lot of these cases don't make headlines, but people who walk out of here, walk out of the office, happy, man, I mean, happy. <laughs> happy, you know, they, they, they stood up for themselves, you know, maybe they didn't get a million dollars, maybe they did, you know, but they got something that they considered a win. And, um, you know, I'll never forget, I had a, I had a woman that came in here, um, you know, it was just a, it, she, she worked for a big company here in town and she, you know, doing great. And then had the bad judgment to have a baby and they decided they didn't like her anymore. And so they started, you know, writing her up and doing all these things. And, um, and she came in that its office and she looked like, she looked like death warmed over. I mean, she just looked beat down. Mm -hmm. And we took the case and got a decent settlement for her. Not, not anything life changing, but she came in the office to get, after it was done, to get the file. And she looked like a different person. Yeah. She was happy, you know, color back in her face. She literally looked like she'd been out of, she'd been in jail and now she gotten out of jail. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a difference in her. And so it was just, you know, and she's like, I can't thank you. So, and again, this was not an earth shattering settlement, but it was a win to her and it right. got her out of that job and onto something better. So know that, yeah, there are a lot of pitfalls in employment law and you gotta be reasonable, but you can win. I mean, it's you possible. Can win. Yeah, we would not do this. You know, the, the world is already painful enough, especially right now. Right. And I know Tom well enough to know that if there were no wins, if this was all doom and gloom, we would not do this. There are exactly. other things right. that we could do. We would not do this. We do this because for every case that may go wrong, or every pitfall we tell you about, there is a case that just makes us so happy and, and a client that makes us so happy. And even having a, a good relationship with opposing counsel, there are, the good, there are the good parts in this. And to see somebody come back later, one of the first cases I did at the Spiegel Firm, and I was not on the plaintiff side. I had not done plaintiff's employment work in my life. Um, <laughs> one of my first cases was a pregnancy discrimination case as well. The client had started being discriminated against when she was pregnant. It continued throughout her pregnancy. It continued when she had the baby. And she finally was not fired. She quit what we call constructive discharge because things were just so hard. And I think she quit when the baby, the baby may have been about two. And employment law can go slow sometimes. The wheels of justice turn slowly. But we finally settled the case for a really good amount. And her little girl, I think, was about five. And she brought her to the office to sign. Oh, the that's awesome. And she said, I want her to see. I want her to know that you could fight. And of course, five-year-old, we have crayons and things in the Spiegel Law Firm office. So the five-year-old was more excited about playing the with the toys. But that was a moment for me. That probably was a defining moment where I decided I was going to keep doing this and not go back to the kind of law I was practicing or not change the kind of law I was practicing. Because you have those moments all the time that just make you feel, you know, so good. Or you have that moment where a client, a former client recommends another client to you. Or yeah. you have your really big moments where an opposing counsel who you fought hard with and you think right. they hate you and you think, this person would run over me with a car if I ran down the street and you get a call and you say, well, who preferred you to me? And they say, oh, this attorney said they had a case against you and you were great. That, that's the kind of stuff that keeps us going to win. And all of those I consider are wins. Allowing a client to be able to talk to the CEO, even though I would have preferred the money. But that's yeah, a win for us. That's, that's a win. win. And, and that CEO is not picking up the phone if you weren't there, right? If that client hadn't come to you, right? And you'd shown up on their doorstep, that CEO wasn't calling, that CEO wasn't calling that. That person, so I, that's absolutely a win. I, I think that's a great story about the about the, the bringing the bringing the little girl in. Um, well, this has been a lot of fun. Those are our absolutely. three things. We'll have to do it again, like uh, late night with drinks or something. That's right. Power to hold firm point in. <laughs> we, did, we didn't bring the drinks, like we said. The next time we'll bring the Actually, drinks. I have one somewhere over there. All my technical <laughs> difficulties stressed me out, but hey, that's how that's the life we're living. Everybody's on Zoom. Everybody's using internet and. But right. you know, we're taking away, just like in employment law, we have to find solutions. I think this this time is a great time for, for practitioners like us because we've had to find so many solutions. Um, people like Tom and I, particularly Tom, was ahead of the game. So Tom has been on Zoom for, for when I started working for the firm, you know, he, he was already doing instant messages as meetings and video <laughs> meetings and I don't know what you knew about this time. <laughs> I know, right? I, sometimes you just get lucky. Well, Phyllis, and we'll, you know, we guys obviously will have uh, uh, information about your firm uh, on the video, but to also tell people where they can find, of course, they can find you at Spiegel Law, you're of counsel here, but where in Nashville they can find you. If somebody wants to reach you, where do they, where do they look? 
Yeah, you can find me at Ramsey Law. It's on my shirt. These are the only clothes I have in the pandemic, but it's Ramsey Law and it's Ramsey Law on Facebook and it's Ramsey Law on Instagram, or you can just call one eight 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 ramsey one Nice. I'm jealous of that phone number. <laughs> uh, Phyllis Ramsey, is, it's, uh, it's a pleasure having you. And if you want to find us at Spiegel Law, you can find us at our website at spiegellaw.com or you can call us at 202 202- Four four nine eight five two seven, and uh, we'll have to we'll have to do it again soon, Phyllis. All right, all right.